welcome everyone to Textiles and Tea with the Hand Weavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising Manager, and I get to be your host today. We want to thank our sponsor today, Southwest Women's Fiber Arts Collective. I uh, left off the S, so my apologies to them. Uh, they're going to sponsor one of their own today. We will take questions as usual, but if you would, please put them in the Q&A and not in the chat. Um, as always, I can't see them very well if they're in the uh, chat. So put them in the Q&A if you would, please. Um, today we have Donna Foley. Donna is a weaver, a dyer, and for many years, a shepherd. Her passion for working with plants began with a forest ecology uh, a pro project and then continued with a self-study of native dye plants that included experimenting with dyeing different breeds of sheep wool. Once she started working with all these different sheep wool, she found Lincoln logwood, log wool, long wool fiber, and she fell in love. That was the wool for her. Um, she has, then she started raising the Lincoln sheep for more than 25 years. And she custom spins yarn from their wool and along with the natural dyes. And that wool and those natural dyes became the foundation of her main uh, body of work, weaving contemporary Southwest tapestries. She was a production weaver contracting with Fratelli and Lockwood Textiles. And she's an ed educator. She ran the weaving studio at Camp Treetops in Lake Placid, New York. She created a fiber art curriculum for Paul Smith College. And she has taught at various conferences throughout the US, including the Intermountain Weaving Conference and Convergence this past summer. We were excited to have her there. She exhibits her work um, throughout the Southwest as well as the Wild West Weaving Gallery in Silver City, New Mexico. Hey, Donna, welcome. Hi, Kathy. So great to be here. It's so nice to have you here. Well, let's start off with the important question. What is your favorite tea? Well, you know, this might be the hardest question of the whole interview here. <laughs> I feel like my tea drinking is an important part of my whole process. <laughs> and, there you uh, go. So I'm a huge tea drinker, and I drink mainly Newman's organic black tea, just um, for my everyday all around tea. Um, but then I also like some um, lemon lift black tea and Irish breakfast. And then by afternoon, I have to switch over to herbal and tension tamer is my tea of choice in the afternoon. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't want to try that tension tamer. That sounds like a good, a good afternoon tea. It, it is, it's a good one. <laughs> So tell us a little more about how you got started in with fibers and weaving and felting and all the things that you do. Well, I'd love to say that I had this, um, you know, uh, grandmother and cousins and sisters that taught me all of their, you know, hands-on craft, but I didn't have any of that. No, no, <laughs> um, that wasn't done in my family. Only only kind of recently do I realize that um, I have cousins that are like 10 years older than me that are very artistic, but um, it, I, it wasn't in um, anything that I grew up with. Um, but somewhere around 12, I, I just decided I wanted to learn how to sew. So my mother did find sewing lessons for me. So that kind of started my path on um, fiber. And I don't even know when I realized I can't remember when I realized I want to be a weaver. I, I don't know if it was from sewing and just realizing I wanted to take it even a step further and actually make the fabric that you would sew with. It's kind of, it was a long time ago, so I don't actually remember anymore. But I know I had never seen a loom. I had never seen anyone weaving. I had never seen hand wovens, but I knew I was going to be a weaver. Um, so um, it wasn't in my scope of things to go to college for art or anything. It, it, there wasn't any art background. I didn't even have art in, you know, in school. It was not done. So um, I went to my forestry school and, um, but somewhere around there, I was really, you know, just knew that I wanted to weave. And I had, so I was at that time living in the Adirondacks of Northern New York, an amazing uh, wilderness area. Um, but there was, I decided I want to go back to school for botany. So I had left the area 
and was in you know getting my bachelor's degree in botany when I found out the community college where I had lived in Saranac Lake decided to open up a uh, craft management program and um, that just and so they were going to have looms um, now I've listened to some of your textiles and tea and you've had wonderful people on including people talking about the Haywood Community College program of uh, craft management and how important it is to get you know all those different classes and learn different mediums and and that's totally what North Country Community College wanted to do and I didn't do any of it I just wanted to weave I didn't take any of the other classes I just I was in the weaving studio just eight hours a day five days a week I left I left my botany like mid semester. I just left and said, "No, I'm going to go weave." <laughs> and so that kind of got me on that. Um, uh, that got me running. Now I drove my weaving teacher crazy. Um, the library <laughs> had the the book "New Key to Weaving" by Mary Black, and I just wanted to do it from cover to cover. It was supposed to be an introductory weaving. Like you're supposed to do, like play a tabby and a twill, you know, and. Nina Holland, who's an amazing um, weaver and painter. Um, she's written books and um, she was my teacher and I think it totally drove her out of her mind. Um, but um, years later, we did become good friends. <laughs> I don't think she liked me for a while. I just, I, I really just jumped into it. And at that same time, I had, um, we had bought an old abandoned farm. It, um, and I got, my husband got me a loom. He bought me a spinning wheel. We got uh, fiber animals all, all within like, you know, like a six month period of all of that happening. So wow. I was doing it. So it felt great. It does feel like it was a calling of mine because I, it, there wasn't any background there, but I just knew I had to do it. So I'm just so thrilled that I'm still doing it now. And that, um, yeah, I'm still totally fascinated with it. It is, I still have so much more I need to do in this weaving world. <laughs> but, um, well, lucky for us, you followed your passion. I'm so glad. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to talk some <clears throat> about your work, and some of your work reminds me of mandalas. Now, I'm a, I've got an art therapy background, and mandalas were big in that. So, Every, I just thought how interesting it was. And even though usually mandalas are considered to be round, these are not, but they, they have that center that you, that things radiate out from, or maybe it's that there's a center and it's surrounded or even protected by the outside. So am I way off base or could that possibly apply? <laughs> No, I love that thought. I totally love it. Um, you know, I think of mandalas as being uh, guides for meditation, and certainly that is what I'm hoping with my pieces. But um, knowing you were going to bring this up, I actually looked up, well, what actually is a mandala? And one of the descriptions of it is it's a geometric configuration of symbols used for meditation and a tool for spiritual journey. I was like, oh, yes, totally then. <laughs> that is totally what I'm going for. So um, thank you for making that connection. Um, yes, I guess I do feel, I guess um, crossroads come into my work a lot and that feeling mm -hmm. of being centered within your world, I suppose. And so a lot of these I feel are centering, grounding, and hopefully, you know, meditational pieces for people who have them in their sacred spaces, their meditation places. So um, yeah, so I love that connection. Thank you for, for saying that. So some of these are, when I look at them, technically they are asymmetrical, but there's such a balance to them. This one on the right's a little more asymmetrical than the one on the left, but there is such a kind of asymmetrical symmetry to them. There is Such usually a, a center part. Um, many of my earlier ones, I would leave exposed um, warp threads, kind of like windows. And many uh -huh. times those were also in the middle. Um, and I guess neither one of these pieces have it. Many times I do put in porcupine quills because, and it's the African ones because they're amazing. But I love that idea of protection, like to create the special space you know, that center point and you have protection around you, which I guess the piece on the 
on my left anyway, the yucca sticks sort of feel that way to me. It's sort of a, a, a protection that you can go into this space and, and, and feel protected. And so the porcupine quills, they're from such a gentle animal and yet it's such a strong presence of protection. So yeah. they find my way. They're not in either one of these pieces, but um, they find their way often into it. Um, well, as we go, we're going to look at several of your pieces today. As we go along, if you see that, um, let us know. I'd be, I want to see oh, it okay. too. Um, I, I have a little story for this next piece. I, I looked at this work, and I am, and it's called Membres. Membres, how you pronounce it? Sorry. Um, and I immediately Googled it. I wanted to find out um, what it was. And I, I'm looking at the definitions, I'm reading the history of this. It's an Indian uh, community, right? A uh, historical Indian group. And then I'm watching a video of a professor doing a, a, a lecture about it. And then I'm looking at the artwork because the work is mostly black and white pottery. And, and I kind of laughed to myself because I'm on this journey. And I, I realized that how powerful artwork, your artwork, this piece can be that it it's a catalyst. I, I was doing all this stuff just because I looked at this piece of work. So I thought how wonderful that artwork can be such a catalyst. Um, is that a goal for your work? Maybe not to get me to look up something, but. <clears throat> <laughs> well, I do love that. I do love that because um, the Mimbres work is amazing. Um, I don't know if I, that's the cat. I think I'm more wanting the catalyst to work on me the the uh, artwork from the southwest is just we it is just filled with it and we have just such amazing stories so the members uh this had this group of people who did amazing very different kind of pottery than from any of the other groups that you have all in Arizona and Utah and um, very black and white, a lot of anthropomorphic, interesting like stories within these bowls. But of course, I think they were amazing weavers too, but I don't think there's been any um, weavings associated with them because of course they don't, they lived around like 600 to 1200 AD in the, the exact area I'm living in. So the Gila River is 40 miles to the west of me and the Mimbres River is in the 40 miles to the east of me. And it was just this area that these Mimbres people lived, had their lives. And then like many of the people, they kind of just disappeared. Some of the indigenous people, they're actually ancestral Pueblo people. They um, left wherever they built their cliff dwellings and other things, and they s settled in the like the Hopi and uh, other the Pueblos along the Rio Grande. Um, but I don't believe any of them claim heritage to these members people. They seem to have done this amazing work, very different, and then kind of disappeared. Um, and obviously, they were so involved in the landscape here. I guess once again, it's all about where I live. The I always lived in like amazingly beautiful wild places. The Adirondack Mountains is a six million acre wilderness. I now live uh, in outside of the, in the Gila wilderness area, just in the foothills, which is our nation's first wilderness area. So these are really special places and, and the members people are people who just were really embedded here. Their pottery was amazing. And I feel like their weavings must have been just like, you know, like, I, so I'm trying to do what I think they wove, you know, all we have left are their pots, um, but very geometric, very um, interesting geometric, taking sort of that twill line, but then adding and, and kind of like a jazz improvisation onto it. Um, they really knew their materials and their landscape. So um, when I do something like this, um, I guess paying homage and also trying to get, you know, learn about them by doing something that I think they might have done, I suppose. They often have animals in theirs. They have rabbit. They they're amazing. People should look them up. <laughs> the members. <laughs> well, uh, I hope you go down the rabbit hole and see the. Um, I think it was on YouTube. A, a professor was talking about it. It was amazing. Um, okay. Um, uh, several people are asking about the size of this piece. 
Um, I think that one, I do some of these horizontal ones, they're more horizontal. So I think it's probably like 32 wide by about 28 high. Okay. Kind of my guess. Thank you. That's sort of within my range. I Many are between 28 and 34 wide and anywhere between that 28 and 40 five tall. I, I tend to work in, uh, for whatever reason, that seems to be the size that I tend to work in. Well, these next pieces, and I think I have the names right, which is the path to the heart and within the interior. And the thing that struck me about them, and, and I saw it in this previous piece too, is the sense of direction in them. And when I see these, it's like, I want to follow the line and see where it goes. Um, and also, especially the one on, well, on both of them and the previous piece is how they leave kind of the art screen, you know, <laughs> they go outside the frame. And again, it's like, I want to, wanna, I want to go with it. Where does it go? Is that movement important for you? Well, it's interesting. So the one piece is actually the one on the left. It's called Calling the Guardians. And the one on the right is the path to the heart. And uh, they were both from a one person show that I did, I think in 2008, actually. Um, and it was a journey of motherhood. So my daughter was leaving home 2008. Um, so both my kids at that point were going to be in college in a way. And I wanted, I decided to use this show as a, um, you know, just to, to stop and think about this whole journey. So your movement is definitely, I mean, it was a journey. Yes, <laughs> it was quite the journey. And so I think maybe these pieces, you know, I don't think it was intentional, but I can understand why you would see the movement in them. And they are actually all longer because it was, it was trying to talk about this journey um, of, you know, in a really important part of my life. So. Um, yeah, so I think movement was important in there. <laughs> this next work we're going to look at is called, um, it's from an art exhibit titled Fiber Rocks, an exhibit of fiber art honoring the Mesa Prieta petroglyphs. And first, would you explain some and, and tell the story of that exhibit? It's a fascinating and very unique exhibit. And then talk some about your entry, which is called Stories in the Stones. So, um, yeah, this was just an amazing project to be part of. I, I think there was like five different entities kind of involved in getting this fiber rock show. The ones I'm most familiar with is it, it was um, the Española Valley Fiber Arts Collective. Um, so down here, I'm in the very Southwest part of the state and we have the Southwest Women's Fiber Art Collective. More in the Northern part, there's this Española Valley Fiber Art Collective. And I think actually they recently changed their name to New Mexico Fiber Center, but they're the same. And they, I don't know how it all came about, but they were in conversations with this Mesa Prieta um, petroglyph center that um, I guess some people on the Mesa, the Prieta, Black Mesa up there, up near Española, there are thousands, thousands of petroglyphs on the rocks. It is, it is amazing. It is an amazing place to be. And so they envisioned, they along with the Mesa Prieta people, I guess it's on the Wells pe petroglyph uh, preserve. So they're preserving it. And I think they wanted to get the word out of how important it is, this cultural, you know, um, all these petroglyphs there and, and to protect them and to get people to honor them. And so somehow this project came about that um, the, I think there was 18 fiber artists. Uh, we applied and, and we were, I think eight, I think they chose 18 of us to come and actually spend the day on this mesa and just wander around. And, and we had a guide, I think the people from the um, um, Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project were our guides. 
and just spent the day just wandering these canyons. And I mean, some you stayed on trails, but some you could just peek around and they did show you some of the main ones, but you were also left just to wander. And, um, and just, you know, some people took actual sketches of particular petroglyphs that spoke to them. I more like wandered around and just tried to get um, the feeling. It's just so magical. So uh, you could just hear like drums going and flutes going and people being there in celebration or in some kind of ritual. I mean, it is packed filled with um, mainly, you know, I think they can go back some of the older ones to around 500 AD. I'm not actually sure of the of the time frame, but I think a lot of them are between 900 and 1200. Um, and I think the idea is they wanted to, yeah, get people to understand what incredible culture this was. And so uh, the Española Valley Five Arts Collective said, well, why don't we do an art project that will um, take artistic interpretation, you know, fiber artists can do whatever they want. There was felters, there was basket basket makers and weavers and um, printing on fiber. And, you know, there was all different uh, artist interpretations um, of it. And then it circled around quite a bit of uh, Northern New Mexico is in Española. Uh, it might've been in Albuquerque, I believe it was in Taos. And then it was up in Santa Fe. And um, uh, it was sent, the deputy director of the uh, Museum of International Folk Art um, that um, they were the juror. And I was oh. extremely proud to get first place in technique from such a esteemed person um, for this piece. I wish it was a clear, I had looked to try to get you a better photo and I, I'm, I'm kicking myself. I don't know where the actual proof that went to the brochure, there was a, um, a, a show brochure put out with it. But um, I, I think the um, juror liked that middle piece is a wedge weave piece. Um, mm -hmm. So woven eccentrically. Um, and then of course I did add all my findings and stuff and just the colors, it was like the deep gray is what you see. And I, you don't actually see oranges and reds there but you can feel it. That's the feel of the place. And there's so much ritual and, um, and beauty there. Um, and then I was there towards the end of the day with the sinking of uh, the sun. And so maybe I guess that's where some of my colors came from too. And I just, I didn't, do what some of the others did like some really copied particular petroglyphs the entire show is just beautiful everyone's interpretation it's just I'm just you know I'm so honored to be part of that show and um it'd be worth looking up I think you can still look at the online catalog I think um and see what other people have done belters and stuff but I I wanted to just try to encapsulate just the feel of it I was just going for that ceremony that um deepness of space in the caverns and canyons. And so that's what I was hoping to capture. Well, the, the colors are beautiful. They're just so intense. I love that. You've said about your work or someone has said about your work. I've read this. Let me put it that way, <laughs> that the topo topography is both external and internal. And I, I see that. In, I mean, I could see that in your work. It's definitely about the environment. You know, the, but I could also see how it could be an internal thing also. Is that true? And if so, why? Yeah, so those are my words. So it's just good. <laughs> I will own them. Okay. But I, I guess it goes back to um, that um, I have lived in really amazing places. I have, you know, I've given up other things so I can always live around what wilderness. And so that is that external landscape and it feeds my soul, which is why I do it. It is just, you know, it feeds my soul. And, you know, that is also where art comes from. So uh, that's why I say it's both external and internal. Cause sometimes I actually am, not too often, but sometimes I'm actually following the lines of a canyon or, or mesa tops and stuff, but other times, 
Um, it is like I'm immersed in that. It's in my soul. And then I'm trying to weave kind of my own, um, it's not even interpretation. It, it just lives with inside me. Um, I do really feel what I'm trying to do, I guess, are to weave prayers. These are my prayers. And of course that comes from your soul. And, um, and that can only happen by living in these. I don't think I could weave what I do um, if I lived in a you know more urban kind of setting. I don't think mm -hmm. that would work. I think my weavings would be very different. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I'd like to say that it's not, I'm not just looking at some, not just, but mine isn't so pictorial that way. It kind of has to simmer inside me and then comes out. Yeah, I appreciate that. What a nice combination of um, just the aesthetics of it, how beautiful it is, but also that there's a, a meaning to it. And looking at it, even if I don't know what it is, I feel like I can come up with my own meaning and it's okay that it's kind of open to that. And uh, I can participate Definitely. in it in my own way. Well, that's good. That is what I, yes, I don't, I guess that's why I don't do too many pictorial things. I, I do my own thoughts, but I, it's, I think someone else can get something just as true and it can be just something else. It's, I, I actually always really feel that I'm in collaboration with my materials and I'm just part oh. of it. And it is the natural dyes that I use. It is the wool that I use. It is where I'm weaving these it is a collaboration of all that. So I might have my own things of what I'm weaving, but that's just one part of the weaving. The weaving is other things too. Uh-huh. Um, you have um, talked earlier about finding objects and putting them in the work. And there are all kinds of reasons. I hear artists talk about why they do that. You know, there's meaning it's symbolic and for some people it's just fun to find things and stick them in the artwork so would you talk some more about adding the fine the found items that you put into your artwork we have a couple of pieces here that i know you've added things to um yeah this was kind of an interesting question because it's just something i do and so i had to kind of dig down a little bit as to why <laughs> and then i realized i do remember when i first started um I was, I knew I wanted to weave tapestries and I was so petra, I was so like, I wanted to do it so much that it took me 10 years before I would start doing tapestry. I was just so scared because I just knew <laughs> I wanted to do it so much. And then I had this wonderful teacher, Anna Well Kreider, but I still, even when I um, um, began doing tapestries and I didn't have all this three-dimensional stuff going on, there was still angst involved in that I just felt like you had to know the entire tapestry before you even started, you know, in order, um. to, you know, you're starting at the loom. I work on horizontal loom. I'm starting there and I'm going up and, and there's no going back, you know, it's, it's all forward. <laughs> and it felt like, what if I forget that? What if, you know, and that happens, you get part way up there and you realize, oh, this, this color really needs to be in here. This, this symbol really is saying it wants to leap in here too. And because the tapper is so slow, you have time to like, have this conversation with your work um and so but then you're like well you can't just leave it floating up here you should have sort of started that conversation down lower and i, I once again i was feeling just you know sort of angst over that and um once i started realizing that a tapestry is only maybe half to two-thirds complete when it comes off the loom and then i can still take note of what what else is being talked about what needs to go in it um it was such a relief it was like oh and, and my tapestries just really loosened up after that too and so um i think it's just knowing that okay once it's off the loom it's not done yet and i still need there are things going on so sometimes i'll weave another panel like that one on the left um uh, sometimes oh, okay. it is, yeah, that's, you know, an added, along with my findings, um, sometimes I realize it just even needed, you know, something else in there to really complete what, um, 
that one's incantations at dawn. And I just, it, it really felt like it needed to be sending out incantations. So um, that needed another piece in there. And then um, once I get a title, it kind of helps too. I wanted to, um, the yucca sticks I really liked and then wrapping them. So I do wrappings, I do braidings, I'll weave more pieces and then I'll do the findings. I, you know, arrowheads and crystals and I'll add on needle felting too is another freeing technique that I use so that it doesn't all have to happen right at the loom. It, it can, I can have it come off and then I can see who it is and and where they want to go and um, complete it afterward. And so that's where the findings come in, I guess. And then I love, I'm always out doing walks and looking for, you know, um, plants, dye plants and things. So I'm picking up roots and other things that talk to me along the way, so. Do, do you ever find something and go, I need to weave something for this? Or is it you weave something and then you find things that match on it or both? It, it's actually usually the latter, which is kind of surprising. You'd almost think it was the former. Um, but I guess because they're just, they aren't the main part. I guess the weaving is still the main part. So mm -hmm. um, I, I don't normally, but it, that could change. That could be one of the one of the things that I work, um, you know, it might happen, but right now it is more the weaving comes first and then, um, yeah, my whole studio is filled with rocks and twigs and <laughs> it's like, like packed that. filled with very organic like stuff that. around here. So um, usually I have it already found, I guess. And then I I, I lay it out and I, I do try to um, get into a good meditational space with all this, all my stuff around me and, and having the one tapestry in front of me and just sort of see what happens. I try not to overthink it. I think to really try to be open to what's going on in the piece, so. And it, it seems to have worked. Well, you're well known for your um, work with natural dyes and we talked some in, in, the bio, in the bio about that. And as a matter of fact, you uh, taught a class this past summer at Convergence about it. And one of the focuses on your class is that you you talk about finding the dyes in your area. Um, and I was thinking about what was your reaction or experience from being in New York and all the dyes you find up in, you know, this northern green, lush kind of country. And then you move to almost the opposite of New Mexico. You know, it's not the green, lush um, so what is the difference? What was the experience like for you to go from one extreme to the other? Oh, it was hard. <laughs> it was really, really <laughs> hard. I um, I knew all the plants in the Adirondacks. I mean, I just, I could take a walk and just literally know like Latin name every, you know, I went to forestry school there. I worked on forest ecology projects there. I, you know, I get plant walks. I, I just knew all those plants and it is really different the plants here are really based more on a wet, dry season rather than the four seasons of the Northeast. They don't always come up at the same time. It really depends on they'll come up after rain and then disappear for maybe two years and you don't see them again. It is, it is really, um, so that's, that's me whining. And then the other side, it's exciting. It's like this whole brand new world of plants. And, and I still though, um, working on it, I am still, really working, although I do, I guess I realize now, I know a lot of them now, um, but it's certainly nothing like um, in the Adirondacks, but it was exciting too, to find, you know, just to brew things up and get amazing colors. And um, I mean, most natural dyes are, you know, the neutrals, the yellows, um, tans, um, which, so then I, I do also work in with indigo, cochineal, and matter root. Um, but I remember being so antsy early on, like, oh, I'm not getting like these incredible, you know, all I'm getting are yellows and stuff or tans. And as my work has gone on, I realized they are so precious. I love all, I mean, there's, I don't think, you know, in, at least I couldn't do chemical dyeing and do all those different little nuanced tans and things and yellows so that when I over dye them, with cochineal or indigo, and I get all these blues and green there. Each one is different. And 
Um, there is so much nuance to it. Um, so now I do love all those neutral plants. But here we do have some, um, you know, you can soak the uh, tunas of the prickly pear and get this amazing fuchsia color. It's not very light fast, but it is still just wonderful to do. Uh, we have Navajo tea that it changes every time. It's from a yellow to a gold to like intense orange and like burnt orange. Um, so that's been fun. I, I feel like there's a bit more warmer colors here and my palette has changed. It is a brighter palette working here in the Southwest than when I was working in the Northeast, I will say that. I think that has to do with the light here and the, and mm. the sun and everything. Um, but uh, I don't know if I answered your question or not. You did, you did. <laughs> but, oh, and so I did, I did delve into it pretty good. And so I, I did write that little booklet. Um, I worked with another artist, Prairie Small, and she did all the photographs because I really do not do photography well. So it was a great, we had such a great time and we just would come together and all the things that we had died that week and, and we took photos. And so I feel, you know, a lot of people move into this area, a lot of weavers, you wouldn't believe the number of weavers here in New Mexico, in Southern New Mexico and in Silver City, like just weavers flock here. Cause I think the heritage, it's just all here. It's just a great place to weave. And so a lot of people do come here. And so I thought this little booklet, it is kind of nice when for someone like me, I didn't have it when I first came here, I would have liked it just a jumping off point. It is, you know, there's still so many more other dye plants out there, but it is a good starting point to, to get out walking the canyons and arroyos here and, and, and start learning some plants. Now, is that booklet still available? Um, I have it. Yeah, I guess I sell it when I do my workshops, I guess through my website, okay. someone could contact me. And I do have okay. some. It was, I should say, because it's kind of cut off there. It was, um, I was supported by the Southwest Women's Fiber Arts Collective once again. So thank you once again. <laughs> They're a great organization. Um, yeah, I had this idea and I approached them and they were all for it. And so they helped me publish it. Oh, what a great idea. I think you should do one for the anaerobics too. Yes. Yeah, I know. I, I guess I realized once I was here, that would have been a really great, and maybe I will, maybe. I'm, there you go. Yeah. Once again, Good you idea. heard it here first. Folks. Good idea. Yes. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> no pressure, but that's okay. <laughs> um, you raise sheep at one time. We talked some about it at the, in the intro and I'm always curious, how does knowing the source of the yarn and working with the source of the yarn change a weaver or a spinner? And, and, and how did it change you having the sheep? Well, I don't know how much it changed because I had it right from the beginning. Somehow I just right. knew I was not a person who could just buy the yarn. And sometimes I wish I could. <laughs> Let me put that out there. Sometimes I wish I didn't have to do every step in order to, you know, get to the point where I was, but I did need to do that. I needed that whole cycle. Um, and I know the weaving traditions I'm most um, attracted to that have uh, been an inspiration for me are the ones that the sheep are really central. You know, the Navajo weaver, I obviously can see from my work what inspiration I've gotten from um, the Navajo and the Hispanic weavers of the Southwest. But I've also, actually a lot of my symbols are actually Scandinavian. They have a really, you know, their sheep mean a lot to them. And the uh, nomadic tribes, um, the Middle East, you know, it, 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 there's something that goes on there when you're involved in that whole life cycle sheep are amazing animals and, and that's why they are in so many, um, you know, mottos or, uh, you know, historical statements or whatever, the shepherd mm -hmm. and um, the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep is so close and so strong and they trust you and they need you. And then you get from them their fiber and possibly your meat. And um, so having that cycle, um, you know, you're really involved in like the breeding and then the lambing boy, you're really involved in, I don't know how many, you know, 
my kids would come downstairs and the house would be smelling of a barn and there'd be lambs by the wood stove and oh. they complain, but I knew <laughs> <they> loved it. <laughs> but, and my husband's so supportive of it, you know, um, bringing, you know, yeah, the sheep into the house if they need it or moving the fencing, moving them around so that all the pasture worked for them, that whole farming aspect. Um, I don't know, it, it really was important. And the other important part, of course, were the plants like we just talked about. And we touched a little bit on how I had tried different wool on my natural dyes, and I just wasn't getting the colors that I thought I should. I actually first started with Angora goats and they is so lustrous. And I did get good color on that, but they broke through the fences all the time. There wasn't electric fences back then. And they were always in my garden and we just like no more goats. And then it, I started with stuff or um, a Corydale mix sheep, but the color just wasn't doing it on there. And someone gave me some uh -huh. Lincoln long wool, which is so lustrous. It's, it's like mohair, it's this long curly lock. And it changed everything. It, it really, so it is that once again, collaboration between the plants and the, and the animal and me weaving it, they're dyeing it, that makes it all happen because um, it, it just sparkles on the right kind of yarn. And so um, it was hard to find Lincoln flea. So I, that's another reason I started raising them. Um, and yeah, that whole idea of doing it all, it, it, I just needed that whole cycle to feel grounded in the weaving tradition perhaps and to you know, know what other weavers had gone through and done. Um, but that relationship with the sheep uh, was really important. I don't, once we moved out here, the landscape here is very different than the Northeast. There is not pasture. There is some really gnarly stuff they'd have to eat. So I left my Lincoln Longwells with a very good friend, my veterinarian, and um, so she has the flock. And I would like to, after having sheep for so many years, we could never, of course, leave the farm. Traveling was harder and stuff. Oh, so yeah, yeah. trying not to get sheep quite yet. I'm trying to still get some traveling done, some camping done to, you know, to go to Knoxville and teach at Convergence, which was amazing this year. Um, all those things way easier if I don't have 50 sheep to take care of. But here in the Southwest, we do have the Navajo churro, which is considered a mm -hmm. land race breed. It can really thrive in this very gnarly environment. And so that is in my future, um, but I'm just, I'm trying to be patient, but I really want them. So we'll have to see. And that will change a bit. They, the older style of Navajo uh, churro actually have a very shiny outer coat, which is sort of similar to Lincoln. So, and they have so many natural colors and that really um, thrills me. And I'd like to explore that. Have you dyed churro already? No, because I, I have some and I've been spinning some, but it's all the natural colors of it. It uh -huh. has this like, like a hazelnut and a mocha and this, and it's very different. Even their gray, the, the Lincoln gray is almost like a steel gray, a, almost like a blue gray. It's a very uh, cool, you know, you do get colors uh -huh. of Lincoln, but it's a much cooler one. The Navajo churro, definitely on the warmer side. And um, I, I'm just been loving their naturally colored fleece at this point, but I'll probably start dyeing it. I, once the dye pots get out, <laughs> everything around gets <laughs> in there and dyed, including my hair sometimes. So <laughs> my clothes and yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, the reason, one of the reasons why I asked that question is that I'm, I'm struck by, from my own personal experience is that the, the more I, you know, I hear you talking about, you know, I never thought about different wool dyes differently. Duh. I probably should have known that, but you know, the more you experience and the more you, I, the more I experience, and the more I learn, it changes how I look at things, you know, about whether it's understanding spinning more, I understand my yarn a little more. And so I, I'm always thinking that all those past experiences must change how we approach things and, and view them. I think if I lived on a farm and did what you did, I would really appreciate yarn more. <laughs> I would probably never throw away yarn. It's like, are you kidding me? Do you know how long it took and how much work it was to make this yarn? So it is true. It is true. It is Even true. Like drums and stuff. You just like, oh, but you can compost it and it feels okay. But yeah, okay. the whole process of shearing it every year was such a process. 
I didn't cheer myself. It's like, that's the one thing I would do everything else, you know, but the, the, I, I couldn't ever do the electric shear. I did hand shear some of the sheep, but mainly I get this guy to come in every year. He was fabulous. And, and, but yeah, it was a whole, it was a whole thing. And, um, you know, skirting the fleece and, and, um, Ugh. and then yeah, spinning it. should be left to professionals. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> well, um, what's next for you? Another book? <laughs> Traveling, it sounds like. Well, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, teaching has always been a big part of what I did. I, you know, it, you know, it was almost half and half between my own personal work and teaching and a little bit less in the last, you know, uh, eight years anyway. But of course, during COVID, you know, hardly anything at all. And then to go to Convergence this year and to be able to be a workshop leader and to teach, everyone was just, I, I was really nervous because I hadn't really taught in like two years and everyone was so lovely and it was such a great feeling. I'm so excited about teaching. I will be teaching at the Midwest Weavers um, Conference, which is in Iowa, I think Dubuque, Iowa in uh, June. And um, I have some other proposals out there. So I, I, I'm, like I say, since I don't have the sheep, I would like to try and do um, maybe some, have some proposals both to conferences and to craft places. Um, but I also want to um, camp around the Southwest a lot more too. I want to get out uh, and really soak in this history. It's an amazing place. So, um, Kind of those things, but of course the weaving is always my home base. So I like always come back to the studio. Well, we got tons of questions. How about we ask some, okay? Sure. Um, and I was curious about this too. I don't think I ever asked you, what kind of loom do you weave on? Oh yeah, I am such a counterbalance, old style, just counterbalance. I love counterbalance loom. So I have like four or five Leclerc, actually I have more than that, but <laughs> let's say at any one time, I have, I have four or five Leclerc looms. Mo I, I do have a 12 harness um, jack loom, but my tapestries, I, uh, I have just a 36 inch Leclerc fanny that was gifted to me by someone I didn't even know who loved my passion in weaving. And it was such a gift. It was so beautiful of her to do. And so I, I always just feel so good weaving on it. So um, that that's, and I love counterbalance. It's just, I love counterbalance loom. So, yeah. Um, I know we've talked about that you are a dyer and a spinner, but somebody was asking on um, the pieces that you showed us today, were those spun and hand dyed and hand spun and hand dyed? No, so I now, my very early pieces, I were hand spun, but okay. for a very long time now, 20 years now, I've um, had my yarn, my wool custom spun for me into a singles, very like my hand spun. Taoist Wools used to do it. I used to ship it away from New York out to Taos because they were the only ones who could handle Lincoln fibers like 10 inches long. And wow. I don't shear twice a year. It is a long, curly, beautiful lock. Actually, there's... The lock of it can't really see, ah. but it's really curly, and this is shorter. Mine used to be pretty long, um, and now I send it to Mora Valley. They they'll do also do it. It's very similar to my hand spun, but I have found I like the consistency. Maybe if I was a better spinner, I like spinning, but I don't get too carried away with all wraps per inch and things like that. So um, it's probably better. But all of my um, I don't dye black, but all the other your colors in my tapestries mm -hmm. are all naturally dyed. Um, and like I say, I mainly do indigo, cochineal, madaru. So, you know, and I play around with others. I do like Kamala. I just tried Himalayan rhubarb for the first time. That was really fun. But really I do like to just gather lo the local plants for those yellows, um, golds, and then take, you know, play with it with the cochineal and madaru more and, and also the indigo. Well, you've talked some about how you start at the bottom and you plant, and you said it sounded like it was pretty spontaneous. Do you ever use a cartoon? No, Draw I don't. Ahead of time? What? I do graph paper. I do do some oh, sketching okay. on graph paper, kind of know, okay. like, you know, like you say, I do have, I do tend to do borders and, you know, wear my panel. So I do, um, 
I suppose that could be considered. It's not really a cartoon though. No, I'll, I'll do an initial plan, but I do try to keep it pretty open. I don't want mm -hmm. to um, over analyze. I kind of want it to let it, um, the things come out um, as I'm leaving. So. Well, then I'm gonna skip down to this question because it's such a good one. This is from Sue's Sari. Hi, Sue. Your work is extracted from your heart and is filled with thought and meaning. Do you work on one piece at a time to allow the woven prayers to emerge or can you work on multiple pieces at a time? Great question. That's a good question. It is. No, I do just do one at a time. Uh -huh. But once they come off the loom, I will sometimes have just two. I don't think I do any more than two, but sometimes I'll have two laid out on my table, like I say, with all my my findings and things. And and sometimes I work that way. And I'm not quite sure when I feel um, I need to do that and when I need to concentrate on just one. I'm not, it must be something kind of mentally with me, but I'm not sure why, but um, it, it's either one or two, but I do, I do try to give them their, their space. Yeah. Um, for some of the larger pieces, this is from Nancy Feynman. Hi, Nancy. I'm, I'm assuming she's talking about the panel. She says, for the larger pieces, are you weaving one total piece? Or are you combining, yeah, are you combining three separate panels? Well, some, um, I think was one of the first slides for a while I was doing um, like a main panel and wings. I kind of like okay. the idea of wings. Like a triptych? And yes. And they're like those, usually they're in black and then um, some things going on and this sort of frame. Yeah, and then the main piece is quite big. Um, so yeah, so they were woven in separate places. Not this one, I think it was the very, maybe the very first slide, it was the red one. Um, oh, that one too. So the one on the right um, and that one. Um, okay. They'll have my wings to them. Okay. Prayers and Charms from Turkey Creek. And yeah, I, I just, I like those panels there. And I I haven't done them very recently, but I'm sure they'll come back. And then, like I said, there was that other piece, uh, Incantations at Dawn, that I had a um, wedge weave piece in the middle. I, I guess uh, many times now I'm at least doing some other, either off to the side or in the middle. And a lot of times it's wedge weave. I, I like sections of wedge weave. Um, so I'll weave them separately. Sometimes I have a, um, what kind of loom is it? Oh, it is, it's a Leclerc tapestry loom. And I'll um, sometimes weave smaller panels or sometimes on my rigid heddle too. I can fold it up and take it with me if we're going camping somewhere and I'll do small wedge weave pieces. Um, they're so great with natural dyes. You know, you can just have done a small sample and it came out great, but then you can never get that color again. Well, you can put it in a small wedge weave and it's like, wow, there it is. So um, I'm, I'm enjoying wedge weave a lot and I'll, I'll weave them in separate panels normally. I have done a few big pieces of wedge weave. I don't think there's any pictures of it. But. Um, oh, I was curious about this too. What do you usually use for warp? Ah, warp. So <laughs> for all my weaving life, I have done, I call it jagger spun. I think at con convergence, people are calling it jagger spun. So I don't know if I'm saying it wrong, but um, up in Maine, we'd always have a gray wool warp two ply. And they just stopped making it. They stopped <gasps> making it between my proposal for convergence in 2019 and when I was teaching this past year. So they Oops. still have it white but they've reconfigured it. It is a, it used to be a thousand yards per pound and gray. And now it's no gray and it's like 1180. So it's a finer. So I'm scrambling. I have um, Mora wow. Valley will, uh, they do a two ply, it's heavier. It's like 860 yards per pound. I usually weave my tapestries at just six cents per inch. Uh -huh. um, and I did just try some of the Mora Valley and, what you have to do with them, they don't have consistent, they don't try to do consistent. Someone gives mm -hmm. them a whole bunch of churro, they blend it up, they spin it into warp yarn, and and it's that for it's a, a color gray that they will never get again. So you have to buy as much as you can so that you have, you know, you can put on a long warp and do a bunch. Um, but it does work at my sick. So I am feeling a little calmer. Um, because I I could I have some of their 
two ply, but in white. And so I, you know, I'm thinking of soaking it in like, um, well, I did do a bit of that soaking it in um, walnut to like just sort of antique it. I like white isn't what usually works in my tapestry. So yeah, yeah, I, can see I, I have a stash of the gray and <laughs> I bought out as much as Mora Valley had of this one two ply, which was a pretty nice gray. It was a little lighter than I normally. And then I'm going to be on the prowl looking. <laughs> so if you hear of anything, let me know, please. <laughs> so you use wool as a warp? I am very uh, adamant about that. Um, wow. A, it is a wool, I mean, it is worsted spun. Uh -huh. And it it just seems to work. They mesh together. Um, and I, I know I teach at Convergence. I taught, you know, tapestry weaving on a rigid head of loom and and I went to the ATA meeting and people were like, you can't do tapestry on a rigid head of loom. It's like, <laughs> if you have a wool warp, you can. I think if you work with cotton, you probably can't. That really like stretches things out. But wool is magic. Wool is an amazing fiber and it will, you know, it's elastic enough to regain its, you know, it can stretch out a little, but not pucker. And, and it just seems to mesh good with my wool. So yeah, you can tell I'm, I'm, boy. <laughs> I usually see a few things, but we'll I've work learned work. so many things today. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> now what are you teaching at Midwest? I am doing similar to the convergence. I do southwest uh -huh. weaving, so a, a weft-faced weave. So I play all those color and weaves you can do as a weft-faced weave. I do that on one day, and then the next day we get into tapestry. Um, and actually in the Midwest, I'm going to do a third day and we're going to do just some lace weaves because I, as much as I do love tapestry, I do do other kinds of weavings, um, wearables and things. So, um, yeah, it'll be fun. I, I will be, will the, will the some um, of those hand manipulate, I guess it's sort of like tapestry, those hand manipulated lace weaves, you know, like Lino lace and, you know, Spanish lace and Danish medallion. Um, that's that same idea of getting your hands in there, which is just, I love it. I, I, I do love getting your hands right in there. <laughs> Will you be weaving on a rigid heddle or they can bring whatever they yeah, want? Yeah, so I, I love teaching beginner weaving. I love it. I love their energy. I love their questions. I love that someone is new to this thing that is so much in my heart. So um, I think rigid heddle is a really great way to introduce people to weaving. The, the big looms can, I don't know how many people have told me that they have a big loom, but they can't remember how to warp it. And it, it feels so mind boggling and they don't. So they just shove it off in their hallway or wherever. And I hate to hear that. So I, I love the rigid heddle looms because they're very non-intimidating. And I, I think they can really get people to realize that, you know, start there, but then I, I I do like my four harness, eight harness, 12 harness loom. So <laughs> I do encourage them eventually to get there, but. Um... I love that. All right, we got a ton of questions. I'm gonna ask one more. I'm sorry, everybody, I didn't get to your questions. Um, uh, they wanna know what is your favorite uh, plants that you grow in a dye garden? Do you have a dye garden? Actually, I don't. I okay. really feel it's the journey of just going out in, like I say, I live in such wilderness. Um, it's easy for me just to gather locally. Um, mm -hmm. That being said, I do actually want to grow some matter root. I live in a place now we, you know, I think it would grow. I don't think it would have grown in the Adirondacks. Um, so my favorite tea to go and, or uh, plant to go and collect is uh, Kota, also known as Navajo tea. And it is this very, inconspicuous plant. You would just never think of it as anything to collect. Um, and that's the one that like fresh will give you these golds, but if you dry it or if you collect it, I can't ever figure it out. Sometimes it gives me <laughs> this incredible rust that I love. And I'm not like, why did it happen this time and not the last time? I, I'm sure a lot does, you know, once again, all the plants are so dependent. Southwest is all about water. So, you know, if it rained a lot, that's probably why it, but I haven't actually, you know, when I first did this, when I first got our farm in the Adirondacks, we had a greenhouse attached to it and it was just filled with plants and mushrooms, mushrooms that I bring back and get their spore caps to try to, 
figure out and try dying with it. And I have all these intense notes and Latin names and everything. And somehow over the years, I've just tossed that out. And I just, you know, I, when I'm dying, it's just fun. I just like brew things. It's like how I make soup. There's no notes or any, and I, that's one of the things in, the, you said, what's in the future. I am going to try to take maybe a few better notes. So I could tell people like when to, when you could get rust from Kota, but um it is I, I do love collecting that and it, you do have to it won't come out and you'll just get a little sh like sometimes it's in June or May and other times it doesn't come out till August it you just huh. have to be on the alert for it for when just the right kind of rain has happened so um it, it's a gift when you find it and it's a gift dying with it so I do love that one I love that I love that <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being on here today. I've enjoyed this and I've learned so much. It makes me want to go take your class. I'm going to talk to my guild. You got to come to me. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, it's been um, an utter pleasure and honor to be part of Textile and Tea. I mean, I just, I'm just so honored. So thank you so much for inviting me and, and letting me chat about what I love the most. <laughs> oh, it's it's our pleasure. We That's what we live for. It's to hear what other fiber artists are into and what they like. Um, I encourage you all to uh, check out one, check out Donna's uh, fourdirectionsweaving.com. It's her website. If we have more time, I would ask you about that too. There were so many things I wanted to ask you, Donna. We need another episode. Um, and then also on the Midwest Weavers, if you're interested in attending her class, um, I would Google Midwest Weavers and see their conference lineup and what they're going to, what Donna's going to offer. Yeah, uh, I want to thank our sponsor. Sorry. I want to thank our sponsor. Um, the Southwest Women's Fiber Arts Collective. Um, it was a gracious thing to support your own. Thank you, uh, Women's Collective. It's a nice thing that you did that you're sponsoring one of your own and we appreciate that. If you or someone you know, uh, your business, a guild, just you yourself want to sponsor an episode, we encourage you to do that. You can find um, that information on the website, weavespindie.org. And just a reminder that these donations are what support our programming. The Spinning and Weaving Week, our Textiles and Tea, uh, Careers and Textiles, all of our special programming that we're doing is sponsored by your generous donations to the Fiber Trust and your membership. So thank you. Next up, we're going to um, talk about 100 donations for our 100th episode. We are up to 82. Woo -hoo! We're excited about that. Uh, well on our way to 100, I hope. Uh, November the 29th is our 100th episode, and we're trying to come up with 100 donations of $100 to celebrate our 100th episode. So if you're interested in doing that again, you can donate to the Fiber Trust on weavespindie.org. If you've missed any of the episodes, you can watch them again on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, and I encourage you to register to um, subscribe to the YouTube because you'll get a notice when one's been uploaded. It takes us a while to get those up. They're, they're slow to upload. So be patient with us. Thank you again, Donna, having you on here was just a great way to spend an afternoon. Thank you so much. And um, I hope you all have a wonderful week. Next week, we have Annie McHale. Um, we're going to get some inkle weaving in there and learn something about Annie and her work. Hope you all have a wonderful week and we'll see you next week. Happy tea. <laughs>